Welcome everybody. I'm Sharon Constanson, CEO of ValueFin. I welcome you all with us here today to learn about some of the aspects of foreign exchange management that many people are not aware it's such a broad topic. So we will be positioning it so that we know what the broadness of the nature of the subject is. And we'll be running a seven part series that follows here on that will delve into each of the seven areas of the framework in a greater amount of detail. So please stay with us for the journey. By all means, there are recordings of all the uh, uh, seminars that we're going to be doing. Uh, this one just being a high level overview. We'll have a guest speaker on each of them. And today my guest speaker is Andrew Priestley, um, a executive coach, a mentor, somebody who writes plenty books, very, very capable. I don't know where he finds time to write the amount that he does and still have a life. Um, he's also involved in um, helping people in very senior roles make very big decisions that are make or break if they're right or wrong. So it's very critical that we all understand that in our day jobs, that some decisions are quite critical and quite important. And the reason I've asked Andrew to join us is because he helps people make those big decisions. So I thought it might be an interesting contrast to talking about pure foreign exchange, but equally to talk about the importance of competent decision making uh, that Andrew helps people far more senior than me make happen in their big day jobs. Um, as we are, uh, as non-executive directors, many of us might be in that role, or we are governors of schools, or we might be involved as trustees of our local villages, or we might be on a senior level board as well. We all know that coming with a different pair of eyes does give you a clarity into a subject that you may not have being in the woods and in the trees and seeing it the same way over and over again. And I know that's the value I can bring as a non-executive director. So as a Forex specialist and expert, that is the clarity I can sometimes bring to a foreign exchange set of circumstances, a full treasury office, a long-term objective around importing and exporting strategies. So that's what I bring in this equation. But I have with me a man far more clever than me and somebody I'm going to look to share some ideas with over this, this um, up to an hour that we will take. And we're going to brainstorm around uh, how does one make sure you're doing the right thing in your Forex space. But before we get into Forex, we want to talk more sort of general business and general understanding of the importance of how do you work in an environment where you may not have complete knowledge, you may not be the expert. How do we look to solve some of these um, dichotomies that do exist? So Andrew, welcome. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to get to know you over the last months. Uh, we've had a working project together and I do find his insights and clarity and simplicity around what seems so complex when an outsider comes to them, it's obviously a very different situation. And that's the value that somebody outside brings. So Andrew, welcome. Thank you very much for offering to spend some time brainstorming and challenging me on some of the issues <laughs> that we're going to discuss around foreign exchange, which is not your expertise. And that's the whole value that is mine. And I'm hoping that our audience are here to learn how this can help them in their foreign exchange journey so that they make better decisions going forward. Hey Sharon, thanks for having me. There's, there's a couple of points I want to I want to clarify straight up, right? The, the first one is um, most of the people I work with, uh, they earn more money than me. <laughs> <laughs> they live in bigger houses, they drive nicer cars, they've probably got bigger pensions, right? <laughs> They're very intelligent, smart people. They're highly qualified, more degrees than I've got, right? Um, and you mentioned about non-executive director, you know, being a board of, on a board of directors and stuff like that. It's not that we're the smartest people in the room. It's it's just we run the BS detector over what they're telling us a lot of the time. <laughs> we'll hear stuff that they miss, right? And in in a you know, I, my background's uh, industrial organisational psychology, but but 
I work with business people and I had to really understand finance from their perspective, right? So uh, one of the books you mentioned I wrote was a book called How Money Flows Through Your Business. And it's just a, a, an entry level uh, uh, overview of management accounts for non-finance people. But I go into these big, big board directing meetings and they're talking about management accounts. And sometimes I know I think this guy doesn't know how management accounts works, right? This is a very clever person who doesn't understand management accounts. And they'll say something like, um, we made, we did 4.2 million in sales last month. Where's the money? <laughs> right? And, and I'll ask a couple of dumb questions about that. And they still don't have an answer. And that tells me, oh, okay, there's a, there's, a, there's a blind spot in their thinking or a gap in their thinking. That's all it is. But having said that, once they get the information, they make very good decisions. So a lot of my clients, the thing they're trying to avoid is when they, when you've got an organisation with a lot of people in it, let's say I, I've got a client who has 90 people underneath him, right? Uh, when he makes a mistake, that that gets amplified by a factor of 90. And that's a lot of money and a lot of time wasted. and things. So it becomes very, very expensive when you get it wrong, right? So that was my first point. So I'm not the smartest person in the room by any by any shape, but I've just learned, uh, you know, I'm not allergic to money. <laughs> I like making money. I like making a profit. I like growing businesses, right? I know how to turn the money tap on. I hate losing it. I hate making money and then I've wasted it, right? Right. You and I are on a commonplace there. That's yeah. what I really want to help our customers not waste money. Thank you. It's a valid point. Well, you and I have chatted about this. You know, it's the frustration is when you can see something, you go, no, 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 no. What, oh, that old, why would you do it that way? You know, it's simple things like, simple questions like that, right? Um, and the second thing, which I think is worth clarifying, because the first time I heard about what you did, I thought it was currency trading, where you're sitting on a, you've got four screens and you're moving money around the planet. And it's not that at all. This is for, for very well-established clients that you're working with who are, and correct me if I'm wrong, as I understand it, they're doing, uh, they're, they're buying and selling or they're doing they're moving money around but they're using forex as a as a way of exchanging for the the transaction the right? goods yeah it's right. international trade for yeah. corporates that is either our paying or receiving money right? either paying right. or receiving a currency different to your accounting currency got it got it and so so the point that just got me about value fund was um, if you know what you're doing, that's fantastic, right? And you might be getting right advice, but the thing I was most concerned is it the right advice for you? And that's why people bring in someone like myself or they bring someone in like you who does this all day, every day, and you're, you can, you've, your distance from that is situation where you can look at what they're doing and if you've got permission to do it, and, and the way I operate with clients is under uh, non-disclosure agreement, obviously, commercial and confidence, right? Uh, because they've got to show me what they're doing. They've got to open up their books and their systems and things like that. So we have the NDA, NDAs in place. But once I can see that, I think, why would you do it that way? Why would you do it that way? So case in point, I had this, uh, I had this client uh, who um, they, they do really, really incredible, you know, 300 million plus, right? And he was telling me about a particular deal that he wanted to do. And so a lot of my clients, the reason they talk to me is because they, normally if they talk to their team, they've got to, it's got to be minuted, right? And so they have these discussions with me. So they're off the record where they can say stupid stuff and I can say, you're an idiot, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? But then we unpack it in a way. When, and so the, the case in point, and please, I'm not saying this to impress anybody, but just to, uh, that cliche to impress upon you. Um, 15 minutes into this conversation, I'm going, this sounds stupid what he's saying. It doesn't make any sense what he's saying, right? I mean, it makes sense. You'll make money, but you're leaving a ton of money on the table and you're wasting money, more the point, right? And... He said, well, how do you mean? I said, well, why, why would you do it that way? And he started to unpack it. And I said, do you honestly believe what you're telling me? <laughs> it's not even true what you're telling me. 
right? And he goes, yes, it is. I said, well, explain it to me then, right? So, so you, you and I can go in hard, you know. We can so we can say, hold their feet to the fire and say, come on, explain this to me. And he said, da, da, da. I said, mate, you're an idiot, straight up, right? What about that? He said, ah, oh, ah, oh, oh, my goodness me. Oh, you're right, right? And out of that came a deal where they, he honestly, he got off that call and he stitched up a $25 million deal in the next half hour, right? And it sounds sexy, but it's not. It was given given that I can't without I can't reveal the circumstances, but that's a that's a, a quite a small deal for what they did. But it was 25 mil, none the same, right? But had they gone down the route they'd gone, they would have missed that. Right. And so what they it, don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in the same way, I was trying to get the nuance of what of what you're doing. It's 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 like your ability is to it's to look at what they're doing and see the exchanges. And you know, there must be subtle these factors like is it the timing of the exchange or is it the rate of exchange? Because you you're you're either mate, it's not only your my takeaway from talking to you was the first port of call is you're saving the money. Mm -hmm. And then the second port of call is you're making the money. Mm -hmm. Right? In that's where I put it. Thank you. And that's how I do it too. I save people money. People say, oh, geez, you're expensive. What, compared to what you're wasting right now, I think I'm quite cheap. <laughs> right? You're an Australian could be as blunt as the South Africa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just play the South African and the Aussie card, eh? <laughs> but am I on the right track with this? Yes. So um, the point you just made a moment ago around being able to have a visibility into what a company is doing, whether it be as a coach or be as a foreign exchange, external, uh, independent uh, person. The most important thing from our perspective is to actually truly understand the company. Yeah. And I think that is where genuinely any other form of Forex advice you get does not take into context the company. What is the business flows? What are the cycles? What are the seasons? What are the amounts? What are the black swans flying over likely to do to you? What, what change is occurring? Because companies do go through change and they put down a budget and the reality is always something different. You know that, but what is the dimension of change? What's the reason for change? Is it a delay? And those are the kind of things that we can factor into their whole foreign exchange strategy. Because what a company invariably does is they make a decision at the beginning of the year, whether that's calendar year, financial year, budget year, market does something, they make this one big decision. And that one big decision they live with for the rest of the year. And we all know in foreign exchange terms, that decision will be wrong at some point in time. It always will be because the market works in cycles. So we try and work with the company to understand what they're doing and also um, following on sort of aligned to what you were saying, what are the current processes you're following? Where is there a people element, a process element, a procedure element, a paperwork element, a timing element that are all costing money? I haven't even got to the exchange rate yet. But the, people... two, the two things, Sharon, I pick up from, from hearing you say that, you, you said you've got to truly understand the company. That in itself, right, is, is super important, right? What, what, what happens when people get that wrong? Because and a lot of uh, people in a business might know the greater picture of the company, CEO, finance director, financial manager, but they don't actually know the foreign exchange element of the financial flows that are occurring in the in the business and invariably don't know why things are not quite turning out the way they had expected you now it's we expected to have to pay for a widget a on the 31st of may and all of a sudden it turns out it's only going to be the 15th of june why they might that sort of noise that they haven't got time to understand why that's happened what's the impact of that happening that is a reality change within their organization it happens all the time so it's making sure that your forex is structured to deal with that variability of the fact the business is not going to be what you planned it to be um, and i think to a certain extent your directors probably your executives that you work with are dealing with constant changing flows of information 
constant things that are thinking, I thought this was a constant and finding out a constant isn't a constant. And now they've got to rethink their issues through and through. I had a customer the other day, and I talked about black swans, where their product market was, was killed. It was uh, the production side of their product was impacted by weather. They then had a shipping issue due to the pandemic. They then had a flood of supply of the product market globally because other uh, countries got product to market cheaper. Russia came, they couldn't now sell to what was a big market and they made an ethical business decision not to supply any further. And then they were ending up with a complexity around liquidity and cash flow. One company, oh, and then they had a circumstance where they had some IT issues. So, and they are global business. So just one business suffered all these things at a common point in time. And that sort of thing is, is actually just too much noise for somebody who's trying to run the business to now deal with the, what are the forex implications of that noise. That's where we can come in and, and see through all those complexities and say, now what do you do? From, from, a, from a coaching perspective, what I find interesting about that is that a very smart senior person would, knowing all of that, still thinks that they can navigate <laughs> a good decision and where they're ignoring that all of that information. So, I mean, you that that's the value of that unique perspective, clearly, right? Mm. To actually to actually take it across that level. Yeah. Mm. Um uh so obviously when you work with a client when you first go in, I mean you've you've got to almost reach that topic of we need to get to know you. What sort of caveats to put in place? Because because most people I deal with, they're really frightened of being transparent. Mm -hmm. so I've got to ask a lot of stuff. I, um, my insight is this: it's not so much what they're doing, right? Because I, what do I know about farm tech, for example? Uh, you know, uh, med tech or pharma. I, I know nothing about that that industry, but I know how they're being around those decisions. So you were talking about someone who says, yeah, I, I know all this, but in this, this lot of change and, and et cetera, and I still think I'm across the 4X function or the treasury function of the business. Mm -hmm. And yet you'll look at it and go, why would you do it that way? Yeah, why would you do it that way? Why would you take a time window of the one you're doing? Why would you take an instrument mix of the one you're doing? why would you utilize your portfolio in the way you're doing? And invariably it will be done in what appears to them to be the most logical, simplistic method, hmm. which invariably is the most expensive. Or they will try and take high degrees of risk, which can be extremely expensive, but for completely different reasons. So many companies actually it, it's quite simple when you break it down to the, the portfolio method of, of looking after your foreign exchange, where you look at things holistically, not looking at things in a item by item basis. And what happens when you delegate down to junior levels within the organization, the place they will work is with what's in front of them not yeah, the bigger yeah. picture so you have a bigger picture coming from the exec but the operations is looking at today and that's where one of your biggest failures yeah. occur just because the person in the junior level doesn't have the visibility or the strategic insight that the senior person's got and the senior person hasn't a clue what the junior is doing or, or they're frightened to make a big decision Mm -hmm. yeah. And some of the junior people are not empowered to make yeah. those decisions yeah. for many of the right reasons. That middle level tend not to get involved in the foreign exchange. You've got the tactical and you've got the policy and procedure, and then you've got a sort of a bigger strategic decision. And it you, just you know, happens. You, you know, Sharon, I, ha I have a client who um, is in the finance sector, right? But they stress test, you know, when a, we know when a bank or a, a private private equity bank or whatever it is, it gives it, it allows the users to go in and log in and check their accounts and all that sort of stuff, right? Um, at, which is just a sitting duck for cybercrime, right? And 
my guy goes in and says, uh, this is what we do. We look at it differently to the way you do. We A lot of the decisions we share, but there's other things that we do that you don't see, right? No, we've got guys in, in-house who do that. And then they'll say, well, why was it, why were we able to hack into your, <laughs> into your bank? <laughs> why was it possible for us to hack into your bank if they're across it, right? And, and uh, that's the first example. This is, this is where I thought the benefit of you. It's, it's, you know, I know you're doing it right, but it may not be the right way for you to do it or the mm-hmm. most perfect way to do it, right? And the, the second one, this is a really great story. It's nothing to do with finance or anything, but I work for a, a, a very large, well-known hotel chain, right? And the general manager said, can we meet for a coffee? I said, yeah, I'd love to meet for a coffee. He said, will you go down by the pool Grab a coffee and I'll be down there at eight thirty, right? And I said, okay. So I'm saying to the there's a waiter and I'm saying, hey, and he says, he's, he's going like this. He's not allowed to come over and see me. So I went over and I said, can I get a coffee? He said, no, you've got to go up to the front desk and order the coffee there. I can bring it to you once it's ordered, but I can't take an order from you, right? So that's what I did. The general manager rocks up and I said, how does this work? He says, what? So firstly, he didn't even know that was happening, right? And this is a big, big 800-room hotel, right? He didn't even know that was happening for a start off. Turns out when we uh, when we unpacked it, I said, why can't why can't you take an order? Oh, because the, the registers aren't open, the tills aren't open. Well, why not? Uh, because we don't open them until 10 o'clock. Why not? And it turned out that the food and beverage manager used to party pretty hard and he wouldn't unlock the tills. Because he's he's had too much to drink, sleeping so he's got still. a hangover. Yeah, he's sleeping, sleeping off a hangover, right? So that's the time he got in, bleary eyed, and then he'd go back to bed, right? I said, "Let me speak to that guy." Oh, he hasn't worked here for three years, right? So, so that's for me. I see that effect with a lot of my clients. Sometimes there's a legacy process or a system. Mm-hmm. But someone's put in place that everyone's following. Like you've got a CFO who said, do it this way. Technology's changed. We've gone cloud race. We've got real time. I mean, you you and I know big companies who are still running manual ledgers on some things. You see that in the Forex world around a company that has set a Forex policy. Our policy is to be 0% covered, high risk, 100% covered, as equally high risk, because you're stating an absolute is going to happen, whether it's up or down, doesn't matter, 100% of one or 0% is the same risk. Um, and then you come across other companies say you have to be 50% covered. 50% covered of what? And that is never clarified. So you end up having holding people to account to something you actually can't measure if you read the words properly. So everyone's being held account to something that's got a number of 50, 20, 75, whatever the number is. And yet, if you read it, what does it mean? And you don't know. And that's the clarity we will bring and say, but your Forex policy is impossible to, first of all, understand in Forex terms. I hear the board says we've got to be 50% covered. So I was hedge my risk halfway. I get that's what they intend, but what do they really need? Is that of invoice value, transfer of risk, order book? And then they all start saying, hmm, actually, I'm not quite sure. So do you, think, do you think, Sharon, that they're working on assumptions that haven't been tested or? You know I think they understand. It, it sounds logical. Yeah. And so I asked the question and said, but of what? Yeah. Well, of our forex exposure? Well, what is your exposure? Yeah. So you're stress testing what they're saying. Yes. So I'm saying, is that your annual budget? Yeah. Is that the orders in place? Is that the yeah. stuff where you've the goods have been shipped, so therefore risk is transferred? Yeah. Is it stuff that's in the store or left the store, therefore invoiced? And you could just see this perplexed look yeah, saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hadn't yeah. thought to ask all those questions. Uh, and I said, uh, that's yeah. the difference. I can ask those questions because uh, I've yeah. seen it everywhere before. Yeah. I was in a meeting last week where the guy was talking about gross profit, net profit, and he didn't and they were different. They're different, right? Gross profit's different to net profit. And I'm thinking that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I said, do you know, what's the purpose of gross profit? Because he's treating gross profit like net profit, right? Oh, okay. good. Right? So, and uh, uh, he didn't know. And this is a this is really high up in the organisation. So that stress testing of assumptions. Um, 
I, I go to the end of that story that you were just saying, right, where it goes pear-shaped. Mm-hmm. And they go, oh, we, we didn't see this coming. And, and you and I both know there's mm-hmm. no such thing. Really, is there any such thing as all of a sudden in business, particularly where money's concerned? And the problem you've got is, I mean, I've spoken to some of my um, finance directors I'm working with, uh, chief financial officers or whatever their title may be, but the one who's looking after treasury within the organization. And you say to them, you actually, you're in a very awkward position because either way you can be um, defined as not following policy because policy will be defined by who, when, and on what metric. Because it's not clear enough. So you are putting yourself and your business, your operation, your subsidiary, your job at risk against something you think you understand and you think they understand until the moment there's a loss and the interpretation of what has been written could then be different. And, and, and your skill is going in and, and, and again, stress testing all of those little assumptions and mm-hmm. steps. We, you were talking about a, a, a senior person and uh, we were chatting the other day about this. And so your typical client who you then start to relate with, um, I made a list of the things that you were saying that you really like about your clients. You know, they're, they're uh, professionally transparent. They're really authentic. They know their stuff. Um, they're well-read, qualified, experienced. They're working in key roles in established companies, right? Very senior. Um, and they're smart and intelligent. So I asked you the question, well, why would they need you? And so you were saying something like, which was, we had a long conversation. They don't fully appreciate the complexity of that, that the way they're doing Forex can hurt them. That was, that was a, that we had a long chat about that. Yes. Um, they haven't got the time. All they, the knowledge to know what to ask, to understand where the wastage is occurring. That's it. And the, yeah. the issue you've got with the waste is it doesn't jump out and say, I'm a waste. No. It just means that the gross profit and net profit lines end up with the wrong answers or lower answers than yeah. they should be. Yeah. And the other big issue is you end up with, in, a, in accounting terms, you've got a balance sheet and an income statement. And it ends up in the wrong one of those two very often, which can completely change the value of your uh, net profit position if it's that, in the wrong place. That quickly, wouldn't you? Oh, we see it straight away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing you said was sometimes they're dealing with very complex systems in supply chain. Yes. Right, and, but they're going manual on that, for example. Um, I'm trying to connect the dots on your what you were telling me as, as I understood it. The thing that jumped out at me the most was, again, we're dealing with very smart, intelligent, senior, qualified yes. people who don't know what they don't know. They haven't been trained in their profession there is no training around Forex Treasury Management. There's no training anywhere within any professional degrees that teach people about foreign exchange. You either learn it on the job somewhere and you're able to translate it, which in itself is a challenge. So you need to come at it from multiple points of view, supply side, buy side, many companies side, so that you can get a nuance of how that differs. And um, one of the things I've actually got up is a slide just showing how that that interacts to make that a very complex space for a a senior person making decisions around foreign exchange is there isn't something that that exists anywhere that says in your organization that runs an accounting process in this way where you work with monthly rates, you have a year end on this date, and you have a seasonal cycle of this kind, you in this many pairs of currencies, therefore you should. Well, there's no such thing as every company is unique. And I think that is the biggest dilemma that that finance people are having to deal with, is their company is unique to any other company. So where do you go and get the advice? Because if you go and speak to a bank or a broker or a consultant, they know what the market's doing. They don't know anything about your company. So yeah, how can yeah. they give you valid advice for what you need? And you can't share everything because you don't know what to share. And, and, and also, too, like I experience this all the time, the person I'm dealing with then has to then go and report to either senior mm. level or a board level 
who know probably less than what they're doing because they don't do with it every every single day. And yet they'll go, oh, you they see something, oh, that didn't work. Where do they yeah. go? You do see some very strange decisions being made by finance committees, boards of directors, risk committees, where they, the most common comment I get is, but it's too complicated. So you get rid of the solution that actually makes it clear. Yeah. And therefore it becomes more complicated. Yeah. So what they do is they dumb it down and they just buy spot and throw money away. Sharon, can you, can you, answer this or you may or may not choose to answer this but you're dealing with companies who uh how big are these companies and what, what would be an average trade uh, not trade trades the wrong word the ex annual transaction size what would be a, an average transaction size so they're, they're, they've got what are, are we talking 20 million plus companies 30 million plus companies what are they what, what size are they I mean, from, from our point of view, the, the bigger the company, the same amount of effort is a better return. But if you look at companies turning over 2 million sterling, import and or export or a mixture, they if they are losing 4%, that's a big amount of their uh, net profit line, whether they're 2 million, 10 million, 20 million or 100 million. Yeah. So from our point of view, we can help companies of all sizes, but it's the 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 place where they see the value for fee versus revenue that broadness of revenue as a relation to the fee and the fee will be somewhere between let's say 0.3 percent and one percent of their forex turnover but their gain is four percent so if you're at one percent you're making a three percent return if you're 0.3 you're making a 3.27 percent return yeah. So the bigger the company, the higher the ratio um, of cost to revenue that they're likely to do. And invariably, the bigger the company, funny enough, the more archaic or formulaic their processes might be, and invariably where we actually can make the greatest relative savings. So, so if you get a company that says, no, that's not us, yet. That's, we're, we're, pretty, we're pretty cool, have you got like an MOT service where you can... <laughs> Like the, like the guy who says, well, let's let's MOT your your firewalls, for example. Yes. Have you got something like that? That's a, a lovely term. Uh, yes, we do. We have an opportunity to so come that, Most people watching internationally, MOT is Ministry of Transport. It's like a roadworthy certificate for your road, vehicle. Vehicle roadworthy. So, yes, we do company Forex roadworthies where we will have a look and say to them, um, let us come and do... A review. I don't like using the word audit because everyone runs away from the word yeah, audit. Yeah, 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 yeah. But basically, we ask all the questions of all the team in the hierarchy from finance director, for argument's sake, board down to operations person yeah. that's dealing with the bank or the paperwork yeah. or the debits and credits in the accounting system. And we will map what they're doing and then go back and say, these are areas you should be looking at. This is where there are natural areas of savings that you can do. Now, obviously a company can go and do that themselves because we explain to them how to do it. So they could go and do it themselves. Quite often, by the time they look at the three or four or five things they can do, and they say, well, how am I going to manage that it is being delivered properly? Might be where they might say is, I hear you, I understand, I respect, but actually I now trust what you're doing because you've told me about something that is true to my organization. And then they might say, well, let's have a look at the providers in the market, of which Valuefin, which is the company uh, we're talking about today, uh, Valuefin is one of those providers in the marketplace, but probably the most advanced globally in terms of um, getting involved in the business and the market and the accounting and internal reporting. We basically run a full treasury function for the organization. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I, when I work with clients I do a strategic review right? mm -hmm. and it's a standalone thing so whether they use me to do the coaching or not is a relevant it's the same thing yes yeah it's standalone and as a result of that we'll find out um uh what's happening and mm -hmm. then we'll say okay here's some recommendations we'd make um things that we would look at ourselves here's some risks if you do nothing mm -hmm. and here's some options for working with us Right. effectively exactly the same parallel to what you're doing 
yeah. is what we offer. And I don't know what you do on a pricing model basis, but what we say is if you do take the service, we'll, we'll um, <laughs> pay, <expensive>. effectively, we'll <laughs> discount the fee we've already charged you yeah. against the main fee. <laughs> I got there's two things I wanted to ask you about was firstly you've got you've developed a methodology but I want to get to that second but but there's something again I'm I'm going on a quick on a chat we had our avatar like was this woman called Debbie right oh, yes okay and Debbie sort of sums up the your typical person that you're dealing with that when you go into a company you're going to deal with someone like a Debbie or a Neil or something like that but it's the same thing very smart very intelligent key positions and yet here's why they need you right and we pulled Debbie aside and she said look I just want to get it done I want to understand the the, the forex function I, I want you to make me look good don't make me look bad <laughs> I want you to protect us from ourselves that sort of stuff I want you to save us time and money those sort of things um I want you to be transparent what you're doing but it it came down to uh, we want to we want the most effective forex solution and a treasury function that we can trust. Which Nicely sort of summarized. Came, yeah, to summarize that's if we all the things they want it really when uh, you know I, I want that 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 but you know what I just want to understand the forex the way you do forex and I want a, a treasury function that we can trust. And and the question I asked you uh, was it could be 17, 35, 144 ways to do that. But I really challenge you to come up with three big ones. And the first one you said was you need a specialist solution. You need someone like yourself to come in with the systems, the knowledge, et cetera. The second one was, and this was a really interesting access to information. And then the third one was you've got to listen to the advice. Which one of those do you want to talk about? <laughs> you've got to listen to the advice we're giving you, right? Um, it's so uh, easy. The first one was the specialist solution. The second yeah. one was the access to information and listen yeah. to the advice, yes. The specialist solution, um, if you look at organizations, they will happily employ a profession to provide a specialist solution, whether it be your lawyer, your HR consultant, yeah. your management accountant, your tax advisor. Companies are very familiar with employing a specialist because it is an area they've learned enough about to know they don't know the answers. They need a specialist to, to provide that um, depth of knowledge. When it comes to foreign exchange, there seems to be a belief they should know, but yet there's no ways they can know. So it and it's not a profession. So it feels uncomfortable to turn to somebody outside. And who do you trust to turn to on the outside that's going to give you the right answers? And I was once in an organization and a, a, somebody else had walked in with the, the same objective. And he said, well, please stand next to me, be my, my Jiminy Cricket and just check what this guy is telling me. It was embarrassing to listen to the sales spiel that came from this individual that was absolute and utter. I mean, I, I would love to have been able to actually report the individual. It was so bad. So how do companies then protect themselves against what comes to them as learned knowledge? And it's a salesman for an organization that's selling volume. We don't sell volume, we sell fees. This is your fee. We've agreed it. That's the end of the story. You pay me to do my job, basically. Um, the aspect is getting the data, making sure that the company will open that information. And that's invariably, the they don't have it. Yeah. They don't have it in one place. It's in multiple places. But that's fine. We can go and find ways to source of no extra work. And then the other bit is, so what do I now know? I've now learned the so what. I can show you where money is being wasted and mistakes are occurring in the financials. And it's then for the organization to say, Yes, now with that greater insight that I've had no other place of getting from anywhere else, I can now make different decisions. I can listen to that. I can learn. I can implement. They can help me implement. I can turn to the outside. I've got a number of ways now of not ignoring what I just heard. Yeah. yeah. So, so somebody says to you, okay, look, I, I, I get that. Uh, we're talking about the Forex and the Treasury function that we can trust. Uh, you're the specialist. We've given you access to the information. We're prepared to listen to the advice. How does this work? I think this sort of naturally goes into your seven, your formula, doesn't it? Your methodology. Let me quickly share my screen. I'm not going to do death by PowerPoint because that is nothing yeah. worse. Oh, I'm so glad. What, <laughs> what I will do is I'm going to jump through 
much of the slides, but they will be available to everyone who has attended, who can actually then um, look at the, the, the content of the bullet points in more detail than I'm giving now. One of the things that's important is you don't have the training, but the market you're dealing with is very complex. It's very volatile. Every business is unique. So if you take those factors, all four of them put together, we have a major challenge as, as organizations because every business is unique. All markets are volatile and today will be different to yesterday, which will be different tomorrow, and it's going to be different every day. Our training is limited in the space and it's a very complex world. And we are only touching as a company certain parts of it. So whenever we have a framework, a framework makes things easier. It gives us a formula to work to, it gives us a a place that we can use to step our way through. You were talking about the word stress testing. A, a framework almost gives us a place to test all the various levels, which is important that you can use that as a reference tool, use it as a learning tool, use it to transfer knowledge. So putting that all together in the name of the company, Value Fun, it's value, assess, learn, understand, find, internally, what am I gonna do? And what new have I learned in this process? So without being deaf by PowerPoint, I have gone through each of those points and created the kinds of things you would look at. Now, most companies are pretty good at doing the V, you know, the structure, the relationships, they, they get some of that stuff. When it comes to assessing the business and how the business is going to be impacted by foreign exchange, we find a generally a lesser ability at this point. When you ask them to now learn from what they have achieved in the marketplace, how they're going to apply it themselves, I learned something, I know what I used to do, now I've got a gap. I don't quite know how to translate that. So we would help with the translation of that to then continue on your own, continue through another consultant, continue through ourselves. Obviously we want ourselves. Um, but to understand how the business is working, what is Forex doing in the business? How is it imp impacting the center plants? How is it impacting the volumes of our people are, are purchasing? How does it impact how our salespeople are doing things on the quiet on the exchange? You'd be amazed how many times I see that happening. You know, how does that turn into accounting risks? What is the accounts department doing that could be impacting the cost of your product? Um, and then finding the various solutions that can be delivered for an organization. So what do I do now? Where do I go? What, how do I do my foreign exchange? So having a look at what, with that sort of diagram of complexity, volatility, and uniqueness, we can then find solutions for the organization. And then we look at um, internally, how do we make decisions? How do we delegate? How do we report? How do we, um, hedge risk? How do we define policy? And as a result of all of that, how much better are we at of knowing what's going on in the business and therefore capable of making more strategic and then tactical decisions that are effective and valuable? So this is a slide that we will share. Everyone will get a copy of it, which just gives you a very, very, very high level map of what a forex specialist should be doing. I haven't gone into IT yet. I haven't gone into how I do all the detail. It's just, I need to get the stuff done. And then just to finish off, um, the various influencing factors I've talked about before, complexity and volatility, but we have a forex market out there. It's, it's just there. It's the most liquid market in the world and it changes all the time. Every second it's changing. Every company is unique. We have global influences, uh, whether that be geopolitical trade, um, uh, uh, subsidy like oil, some of your key components, food. And we've got different degrees of knowledge in the people that provide and service us. And the forex components that just if I look at just the forex element, we've got a spot rate, an interest rate, time and instruments and people who provide them. I've already got five things I need to get my mind around just in the nitty gritty part of the equation. So those are the, the things that sort of come to mind initially, which 
is not the day job of anybody in the organization. People who are in purchasing worry about it. People who are in sales worry about it. The board worries about it. Risk worries about it. Finance worry about it. Debtors and creditors clerk deal with it because that's it's paper that flows across their desk. They deal with it. So these are the elements that are just all happening within the organization. And we then say, in your MOT example, what actually are you doing in that whole map I've just showed and specifically drilling down into this one in more detail? I hope that wasn't death by power. No, no, it's great. Just, just go, back to the, go back to the first slide, Sharon, where you had the, the triangle one, which was really interesting in itself. Uh, the one before that. Uh, that's the same one as this one with words. Yeah, no, just that word. That's it. That's it there. Um, see, right there, if you go in and say, I've got, it's almost like the perfect storm. If it's volatile, complex, no training, and unique, and every business is unique, even if you're having a conversation with someone where they're giving you feedback about, I don't know how this works, right there is very predictive. They're going to be paying way too much for whatever transactions they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. it's nice very good thing. and then go to your last slide again because this people was i know i'm geeky i want to screen we're going to get one of the screenshotting it <laughs> i'm thinking but that's a, that obviously you've got the processes in place that would then okay let's go through this methodically uh, the the word that came to me it's really comprehensive and thorough what you're doing obviously we get to know a business actually often better than the company knows. I was chatting to the chief exec of a global firm the other day, and we we're talking about a, a different topic at this moment in time. And I said, are you aware? She said, pardon? What do you mean? I said, are you aware that there are certain discussions occurring between subsidiary companies that are impacting both those companies in their sales and purchases that they are doing on a global basis? And that obviously is impacting the group. I said, I have no idea about that. I said, you wouldn't, because you wouldn't see it, you wouldn't know it, they wouldn't know to tell you. But mm. I'm in a position where I can see what they're doing. I'm guiding them. I'm making sure that they are doing what's right by the global business, because I've got a vision of the global business, but they don't. So, And it's not your day job as the global CEO to worry about this kind of minutia. But if you don't, 3% is going out the window. Yeah. So it's, it's, once again, you were talking about that clarity, that vision, that knowing what's going on in the organization at a business accounting, a finance, all those elements, not just a forex element. Sharon, you might want to go back to um, the previous slide to this one. Just go back to you know, one before that. Uh, that one there, right? Mm. So um, nice checklist. if somebody goes, oh, yeah, this is, this is fantastic. That's a lot to unpack. What's the next step? What, what, what's the, what are you, are you going to cover this in one session? Or I think you mentioned there's a program or something. Or? What we're doing from a webinar point of view is we're going to go through each of these verticals over seven sessions. But there might be organizations saying, okay, I'm hearing stuff. I'm curious. So there's two things. You can either contract and our contracts are very, very comfortable. Um, and we get on with it. And you have three months that you have to stay with us and then you on a 30 day notice period after that. Or ask us to do a review and then you can decide, do you want to now take this further with what you've learned? Because you now have a choice of how you wish to take it further because you've got underneath all these aspects and you now have an understanding of where the business can, can create improvements, either through internal changes, using somebody externally, changing the policies and procedures, changing who does things. So lots of things a business can do to address these if they listen to the recommendations that come out of that MOT that we do. It's like when you get out of your MOT, when you've done your your roadworthy check it tells you you need to fix this and this and this within it the next year it, your it car tells you out. what needs fixing that's right yeah and so, this is through the lens of of in, uh, of impeccable forex uh, transactions yeah streamlining so, streamlining those transactions um uh you might want to stop sharing for a sec because people get too much value if they keep <laughs> the am i giving away all my ip very i mean Unintentionally, thank yeah, you. Yeah, but I'm not worried about that because they can't. They don't know what you know anyway, right? <laughs> you can have a take as many screenshots as you like, right? 
Um, I mean, uh, if someone wants to do that, that's and you know, I'm thinking uh, again, you're not teaching someone how to suck an egg, but what you're saying, these are seven. These are seven robust steps that we've found. If you've got an issue, you might have a great game, but this is going to take make it an even better game. So in my case with clients, it's not like they need help. It's they're looking for distinctions. and They want to do better. Yeah. So a client who needs help wants a 300% shift and uplift, right? Whereas I, my clients, one or 2%, and they've leveraged that off the help, right? Mm. They've, they've really done well with that. And it's the same thing here. So... Mm. There's a lot of value in understanding, seeing it from your perspective, if nothing else, right? Um, what's the next step? So the next step for a company would be to give us a call, ask us to have a look at this map um, for them, yeah. do an MOT, either within a three month of learning and delivering or learning only, which is usually a shorter period of time and giving them the choice to go with us, go with someone else, go internally. Yeah, so, so the, recommendations, risks, and options. Yeah. So the next point is give us a call and uh, we will just uh, put out in the thank you email that's going out to everybody. Yeah, we'll provide yeah. a contact point to us, but obviously our website, which is valleyfin.com, yeah. you'll get to us straight away. Yeah, yeah. Have you had have you had a, a client who you've worked with who's who's gone, they've had that oh my god moment, you know, they were I, Gee, Sharon, how did I miss that? Have you ever had clients who go, how did I miss this? And they're smart people, right? Yeah. Uh, it's actually quite interesting how often we worked with an organisation recently and they said, no, we only deal in a certain currency pair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, that's interesting. You don't deal in the dollar. That's unusual because yeah. most companies have do something with the US somewhere along yeah, the line yeah. or priced out of China or priced out of certain yeah. jurisdictions. They are using the dollar, Africa, South America, US, China, are all uh, Euro, yeah. Central and uh, Middle East also use the dollar a lot. So I find it interesting that you don't do anything in the dollar. No, we do nothing. Yeah. A couple of months later, I said, mm, by the way, mm. and yeah. now we are seeing yeah. Yeah. a couple of years into the business that we're working with, how much dollar is coming out in all sorts of different activities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got another customer who changed a supplier from a European supplier to another European supplier, but who builds in dollars, not in euros. Yeah. And the impact that has on their foreign exchange, another organization that was working out where they had to pay another company in dollars uh, in, and had to pay dollars, another internal company had to receive dollars. So they tried to do some netting off, which across organizations, even in the same group is just a recipe for trouble. Um, so you'll get those kind of things happening. We say, now hold on, if you did that, let's understand the risks first before you go ahead. It's the same as we always talked about Rio with uh, when uh, we had problems in the liquidity market. You know, if you actually unpack the instrument, if something were to, go, to change midway in its life, how's it going to behave? And those are the things that companies often don't see. Now, quite often, they don't end up with that risk materializing. But when it does, it hurts so bad. I had um, uh, two points I get out listening to you there is, uh, is, and I see this all the time, people go, I know how this works. And I say work closely with your accountant, for example. Don't make a big decision mm -hmm. unless until you've spoken to your accountant, right? Because they can't reverse engineer the decision once you've agreed to it or you've put that into play, right? Right. So uh, I, I make a point often that uh, with a particular around law and accounting, you, you might get the right advice. I'm not I'm not slagging off at any lawyer or accountant, but you want the right advice for you. That's and and you can only do that with, with a thorough me a formula that you've got there. Uh, and and the second one is I get people say you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. And so I'll have an argument with them where I want them to totally convince me why it can't be done. Right. And then I said, are you absolutely sure it can't be done? Yeah. I said, well, then make, give me a share of your company because <laughs> I want a performance fee, right? <laughs> if you think it can't be done, give me a share in the company. And then they start listening. <laughs> then they go, well, well what, do you, what do you mean? What do you mean? Give you a share. Well, if you think it can't be done, give me a share in the company. All right? 
Well, what, what, see, that's the value of what you're doing. You can see stuff that they can't see. You're seeing it through a totally different lens, right? It's a different lens. And it's, it's not that it's better or worse. It's I don't do their job and I don't have the big no, decisions no, to make. No. I don't run departments of their 20, 30, 100 You're not people. replacing them. You're augmenting what no, they're doing. All I'm doing is freeing up the anxiety that they thought in the morning when they heard the news that something dramatic occurred, interest yeah. rates have gone up again in all the currencies that they're dealing in. And now the fourth one's gone up and I think, oh, we've missed yeah. all of them and I've done nothing. That is a very, very typical situation that a, a senior person will find themselves yeah. in because they're running the business. They're not running the minutiae of the business. Mm -hmm. So they will be worrying about the big contracts, the big merger, the running of the department, not worrying about the interest rate. But the interest rate impact has taken 25% of their bottom line, just like that. And they've not really? been really? proactive. Yeah, so <laughs> yes. that's the kind of thing that can happen. Yeah. And it's for us to think ahead for yeah. them. I had an organization I worked with once and I said that interest rates are gonna change. And you're sitting with a very large amount of dollars in a given month and given the pattern of what i can see in the business there's no ways you're going to use 30 million a month no goodness me never going to do that i said well you've put 30 million there you can't use 30 million and the impact of the impending interest rate movement is it's going to cost you one one and a half percent if you just leave it but if you act now with knowledge we can save you the one and a half percent cost that's coming down the line that you don't need to pay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Hey, I, I got two questions, and I'm sure we probably need to wrap up. But yes, we do. <laughs> are you any good at what you do? <laughs> I'm the best, Andrew. Of course. <laughs> now, now, being serious and not being frivolous for a moment, <laughs> we do have thirty. Eight years odd experience yeah, in yeah, dealing yeah. in this. Yeah, you've uh, seen just yeah, as a consultant. all the dumbest things people can do. Yeah. Just as in the environment of ValueFin and its predecessor, we've got 30 plus years in yeah, experience. Yeah. But if you go back into the Forex world, I mean, that, that's even longer. I used to work in the bank as a chief dealer. I used to work for a corporate as a treasury manager. I've been sales side, buy side. So I've been both sides of it and see how I couldn't do what I needed to do for my customer that I'd expected when I was one. And that's when this all started. Yeah. So it's... Um, it's just years of experience and seeing so many different iterations and how they impact businesses differently that I probably have more visibility than many people, I think, yeah. in the market. I, I, I work with a guy who was, who was in on cyber from the cyber crime from the very, very start, or from the preventing it side of it, right? And he said, oh, it's come down to five big mistakes. I see this, the same five all the time. He said, but that's just time in the market and understanding what's happening, right? right. Okay, uh, last question. Thank you. This is always interesting, right? Usually when you get off a call like this, you go, oh, I should have said that. <laughs> I wish I'd said that. Well, what's the, I wish I said that. Uh, what's the thing you think, oh, if, if, I, if someone walks out of here, what's the thing they need to, the thing you think, I wish I'd said that. What would, what would it be? Now you've put me on the spot. I don't know the answer to that right now at this moment in time. I, I think the most important thing that I want to get across is that independence, the trust, the respect, and that we are actually inside the management team of our customer. We are part of them. We're not part of the market. We don't go and make money out of um, getting a trade done. We get money because you pay us a fee to do a job. And that's the difference. So we belong in that management team, supporting them, making the big strategic business decisions they need to make that involve Forex and can stress test some of their ideas and their strategic thinking in a way that somebody internally probably can't do because you don't ask the boss those questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, my big takeaway was it's not so much it's not for me a conversation about here's why you should use us. I, I'm more concerned what's your plan if you don't use us. Sorry, what is? <laughs> it's not so much you should use us. It's what's your plan if you don't use it. <laughs> Thank what you. What are you so doing much. if you're not using it? You know, what's it? That's my biggest fear. You know, it, it's and it's because we say, oh, I'm amazing, I'm amazing. But what, but you're really saying, you know, t tell me about what's what's your plan if you're not using us. 
you know, what's what's the consequence of that? What's the implication of not using it? Is I think is a that's why I talk about recommendations and risks. Here's a risk if you do nothing. You keep doing the way you're doing it. You know, it's your choice, but but it's an expensive choice. It is an expensive choice. Yeah. Yes. Time, money, resources, mm -hmm. careers, the whole thing. Reputation is probably reputation is a big one. Yeah. Interesting yeah. enough, we find even in big corporate treasuries, FTSE 100 type companies, we still can see areas they can make improvements. Yeah, yeah. They right. will obviously implement them themselves because yeah. they have a full treasury function. Just down to a small business. They just need a distinction. You, you, it's you know, I'm in the distinctions business, not help. You know, you can see one tiny thing. Wow, yeah, I can leverage that. Um, I've enjoyed being a guest. Thank it looks you. like I took over and interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> now I've thoroughly enjoyed talking and sharing <laughs> and putting across some of the things that are important to me which is saving companies money. That is the most important. I hate to see them wasted. Yeah. So thank you for just being there to brainstorm with me, to share the conversation and to put another lens upon it from that of a coach and an executive coach. Thank you, Andrew. And yeah. thanks to everybody who's joined us. I really appreciate it. The slides will be available. I see there were some questions, but to a certain degree, a fair number of them were covered in the conversation. Thank you.